Welcome to Supply Chain Now, the voice of global supply chain. Supply Chain Now focuses on the best in the business for our worldwide audience, the people, the technologies, the best practices, and today's critical issues, the challenges and opportunities. Stay tuned to hear from those making global business happen right here on Supply Chain Now. Hey, good morning, everybody. Scott Luton and dear friend Jenny Froome here with you on Supply Chain Now. Welcome to today's show. Jenny, how are you doing? Really good. Thanks, Scott. It's always great to be here. Always a pleasure. It's like a monthly treat. Uh, the conversations we've had going back a couple of years, uh, we're continuing today our Supply Chain Leadership Across Africa series in conjunction with Jenny and our friends at SAPICS. And these really have been well received. But you know what, Jenny? It's been a pleasure and a lot of fun to conduct with you. Absolutely. And have you noticed how they just keep coming up faster and faster? We finish one and a month later, here we are again. <laughs> we got to slow time down, slow time exactly. down. But hey, for the handful of folks that may not know out there across our global listening world, Jenny Froome serves as COO at SAPIX, which is doing wonderful work from a professional development and networking standpoint. So check them out at SAPIX. Dot org. So Jenny, outstanding guest here today. Are we ready to introduce our guest? I've been, I've been ready for two years to do this one. <laughs> okay. Well, with no further ado, let's officially welcome in Timotope Ugunfayo, Senior Director, Supply Network Operations at Procter & Gamble. Timotope, how you doing? I'm doing super cool. So great to be here, and it's it's lovely meeting you, Scott. Thanks again, Jenny, for this opportunity. I'm super excited, and we've not even started yet. We are, too. And you know what? We, we've uncovered some synergies and some kindred spirits already in the brief amount of time we've been with us uh, in the pre-show. And one of those, Timotopi, is you and I are both big fans, and maybe we we share our respective local fan clubs of Jenny Froome, huh? <laughs> Oh, stop. <laughs> that's true yeah it's very true that's true yeah but you know that there is uh um part of the beatitudes maybe that we didn't capture and document way back in time is blessed are the connectors and you know jenny you do a ton of <laughs> <laughs> you do a ton of ton of work and good work across the industry but man we need these connectors yeah. that make conversations like this one uh uh, uh make them happen so thank you uh, jenny sincerely from our uh, supply chain now team but I digress. So Tim and Topi, uh, you know, this interview and our conversation has been long in the making. I'm, I'm really stoked to uh, learn more about your expertise and perspective and point of view. But I want to start with uh, your childhood, right? We, we love kind of that uh, those origin stories. So tell us about your childhood, I think, growing up in Nigeria. Yeah, yeah. Thanks again, Scott. I grew up in Nigeria and um, I must confess that I don't have pleasant memories of my childhood. It's interesting to note, right? So I grew up in the very poor part of Nigeria, in the city center. So it was in Lagos, the capital of, of, uh, of Lagos, actually. So the, the biggest uh, metropolitan city around. So I grew up there, but in a very small town in, 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 in Lagos, Nigeria. And the memories of my childhood are great. I mean, I was from a very poor background, poor parents, Actually, we were so poor that the poor used to call us poor, you know. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> so, so that was very interesting. Yeah, they used to say, okay, those poor guys, and we're all poor together. Um, so went to, to primary school there, secondary school there. And, you know, I still remember vividly how the classrooms looked. I remember whenever it rained, it was, it was, it was, it was a big problem. I can't imagine my kids, you know, schooling under such circumstances today. It was just some blocks and then a roof over it and the roofs were leaking. Mm. So, I mean, when it rains, classes end for that day, mm. right? But I still remember, you know, learning a lot and, you know, aspiring for a great future. Um, unfortunately, you know, my dad was a workaholic. Um, he wanted to get us, you know, the best in life. But that comes with some disadvantage because he didn't pay good attention to us. His own was just about you know, paying the bills and then let my mom take care of the rest. And as you can imagine, that doesn't work pretty well, right? So, so that also was not there. There were not a lot of people to look forward to. 
Um, I think what kept me going was just a determination, mm. a determination that, look, I don't want my kids to end up in a place like this. I need to make something out of this, right? Um, and, you know, back then in school, you were the local champion. I was the best in math, the best in several subjects, but then I was a local champion. And, you know, I can recount some experiences where we then went out of town into the city for competitions. And then I'm like, wow, look at these guys. Look at the way they speak English. When they tell you where they've traveled to and you've not even seen the airport, you're like, wow. <laughs> so there is life after year, right? But there in that school, in that locality, I was the local champion. I was the best kid in town, right? But when you go out, you realize, you know, the world is bigger than that and all of that. So my childhood wasn't really pretty, right? I remember, you know, reading a lot with lanterns, no lights, nothing to look forward to, sometimes going hungry, uh, sometimes just, you know, being satisfied with one or two meals a day. And, you know, you can imagine how grateful I am when I look back uh, right now where I am. So, so but let me ask you a question about that, Tim and Tope. Um, when you look back and that profound sense of gratitude based on, you know, where you are now and what you're able to do for your kids, as you've referenced a couple of times, is that a daily, um, a daily reflection for you as, as you, you know, think back on your childhood and where you are, is, is that, does that create a daily sense of, of gratitude and, and reflection? It sure does, Scott. I mean, every day I wake up and I'm grateful for what I have, mm. right? So it, it, it comes with gratitude. At the same time, I'm also checking that, you know, the kids that I'm raising with these blessings, are they as tough as I am? You know, they, they look so feeble. They can't do much stuff themselves. And I'm asking, hmm, I pray for this, but am I sure that they are turning out well? I mean, they have everything at their beck and call. I right. had to struggle to get those things, you know? So there is a part of gratitude, for sure, on a daily basis. But there's the other part of me that keeps asking, won't you mix this with a beat, you know, for these kids so that they are toughened up a bit as well, uh, the way you were? It, and what I'm hearing there, Jenny, uh, is it comes with not only a great sense of, of gratitude, but more importantly, perhaps, is a great sense of responsibility for doing and, and taking and leading and maybe helping others, Jenny, is that what you're picking up? Uh, totally. I mean, it's, it's one of those situations where it's so easy to take for granted what we have. And, you know, I, I was brought up and education was, was, I didn't have to work for it. I was given it. And I think that that's something that continues to inspire and impress me the more or the longer I live in in Africa is is just how it's never ever taken for granted um it it's 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 not a right it is a privilege it should be a right but it's something that that even people who who work full time they still make time to go to university in the evenings for classes or at weekends or constantly trying to better their education that that just to improve their their circumstances, I think. Right. And it's really something that you realize you've t I have taken for granted. Mm. As as uh, oh, Chris Barnes says, never stop learning, not for a mm -hmm. single minute. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. So as much as I, I'd love to dive deeper into those early experiences of your journey, uh, you have now, since then, have lived you know, beyond Nigeria, a lot of different countries, uh, Egypt, Switzerland, we were talking about coffee a minute ago, uh, Dubai, which is one of the coolest places, most innovative places, maybe around, around the planet. Um, and, and maybe some others I'm leaving off, but um, Nigeria is home, but give us, you know, beyond coffee, say with Switzerland, what are some of your favorite highlights from some of these other places? Yeah. And, and it's a privilege to live in different countries. Right. So again, that's another thing I'm grateful for. And, you know, when you live in different countries, you see different things, right? So if, if I take Switzerland, for example, Beautiful city to live. I mean, the transportation works superbly well that if you don't own a car on your own, you're, you're, you're fine, right? You're so close to nature. I mean, I remember those evening walks in Switzerland. It's a beautiful place, beautiful scenery, very natural. You breathe in fresh air. You feel, you know, nature is all around you, right? Um, the mountains, are there. One other thing I loved about Geneva is the opportunity to travel to different parts of Europe, 
I mean, on Thursday evening, you can decide that, guess what? This weekend, I'm going to be in Spain. And voila, you're in Spain. Next weekend, you can say, I want to be in Italy. And then you're in Italy. Whether you want to drive, you want to go by train. I mean, I did several road trips with my kids. The experiences will never leave them. I also did some, some interesting stuff in Geneva, like uh, 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 skiing uh, with, you know, Coming from Africa, you know, your parents would ask you, I mean, what are you doing? Are you, are you kidding me? You know, <laughs> and, you know, it was it was funny carrying all those gadgets up the mountain. And you know, in Africa, when when you're successful, you also expect people to help you, right? Even you you want to carry those stuff, you expect someone to carry it to the mountain, and you just get on those stuff, and you know, you uh, it, it was different. You need to carry it yourself, no matter how wealthy you are. And for me, it was an overrated experience. I mean, carrying those dogs, those shoes, and walking as if you're going to fall, all just because you want to have the experience. And guess what? I paid a lot of money to do that. <laughs> <laughs> to, work, to work harder. Pay a lot of money to work harder. That's, the, that's vacation these days. So, um, Geneva, beautiful place. Uh, it cannot leave my memory. It's, it's such an awesome place to leave. You know, I, I had the, uh, the great pleasure of growing up with a Swiss family that moved to Aiken, South Carolina, where I grew up uh, as an, when I was in elementary school. Uh, Stefan Thuring was his name. I've never been able to track, you know, track him since. Uh, but some of their, their customs and culture still sticks out that, that I was able to pick up just when I would visit his house and, and sometimes stick around for dinner and whatnot. So I'm going to have to add Switzerland to my bucket list. But one last question before I uh, toss it back over to Jenny is Dubai. So, you know, Jenny, of course, you and I both know Kim Winter, uh, who, who um, a great supply chain ambassador in Dubai. What's your favorite part? Because uh, I, I believe you make, is that where you live now? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. What, what's one thing maybe folks wouldn't know about Dubai or, or one of your favorite things about living there? I think for me is the way they innovate. I mean, in this city, you can wake up tomorrow and something else has gone up, Right. And if I contrast it with, with Geneva, that, that's a big difference. I mean, I was telling someone jokingly when I was in Geneva, if, if I have a problem with my electricity and I call someone to come and fix it, don't be surprised that the first day, what, you know, the guy comes and tells you, what is the problem? Oh, there is a, there is a short circuit there, but it's not going to fix it that day, right? It would give you another appointment of the day you will come to fix it, right? So things move a bit, they, they are slower. Development is there for sure. In Dubai, is the exact opposite. I mean, you can sleep today, wake up, and there is high rise tomorrow. Okay, I was part. I was privileged to be part of the Expo 2020, 2020 and I was there five, six times. Amazing stuff. All you see around is just innovation. You see people who are thinking, people who are progressing. Even the way their educational curriculum is designed is designed with a lot of innovation. I, I give you an example. It, it, at the Expo 2020, there was a room called the Youth Pavilion. So you, you, you get youth there, and what they want them to do is to dream. Just come into that room, you don't come with your parents, just put on a, on a computer what you want to become in life, anything. And whatever you're feeding into that computer is determining their education curriculum for the next 20 years, is determining what uh, ministries and government parastatals they need to put in place for the next 20 years. Mm. You can see such innovation. It's not, I mean, these guys are thinking. Mm. So every day, every corner you turn to, you see an innovative behavior. And that's what ticks me about this city. I, I love that. And, and, and not to pick on academia or education, but you know, it's really, it, I think it's easy. Um, I think for academic professionals, as they look to bake process into making sure we're equipping students with uh, a great experience. You know, you, you set a great curriculum and, and, and then you move on to the process and then you blink and that curriculum has got to change. And it's, I bet, it, I bet I'm not, they don't let me teach, but I bet it is so challenging to, to constantly update what should be maybe a living and breathing curriculum based on just how, you know, based on those elements you just shared, Timotope, how fast yeah. industry is changing lightning fast. And we've seen that, uh, for good or for worse, uh, even accelerate these last few years based on some of the, the challenges out there. So I know we're going to touch on some of that. Um, Jenny, uh, already in the first 10 minutes, man, the vibe 
and the perspective that Tim and Tope brings here to our listeners. I mean, it's like addictive. So now I know what you're talking about. So where are we going next with our, our dear friend here? Well, I was just going to say, I wonder what they would have made about my ambition when I was at school, which was to be the fifth member of ABBA. I don't quite know how they would have, how they would have done that. That would have been interesting, right? Well, <laughs> Tim and Tope, I think Jenny just... should audition right here. I think, I think, uh, how about a song? I think dance? not. Moving swiftly along, moving swiftly along. So talking about being on the stage and all the rest of it, um, that was quite good. I thought that was quite a good segue there. Um, One of our very, and our, as in SAPEX community's favorite speakers in the whole of the cosmos is Temi Topi. And whenever he's on stage, be it virtual or or in real life, as I call it, um, without doubt, the feedback is positive. It's inspirational, It's, it's amazing. Um, take me back to that very, very first one that you did when you actually won your very first Best Speaker Award. You, it, it, you described it yourself as being life-changing. Why was that? Thank you, Jenny, for asking. Um, you are taking me back memory lane. I don't know how many minutes we've got for this question because it can take me a whole half an hour to explain what happened that day. But such an interesting time, you know. Um, I just completed my certification, and maybe that story for another day. Um, Unfortunately, when I came into supply chain world, um, I didn't see anything in Nigeria, unfortunately. The universities were not offering supply chain. I checked out the curriculum, it wasn't available. Believe you me, Scott, the closest I saw was in South Africa, the closest to Nigeria. That's six and a half hours to seven hours flight. Mm. So I was traveling to South Africa every quarter to take my certification exam. Okay, with CEPICS, and that's why I can never forget CEPICS. So I was always traveling every every quarter, all expense paid by me. Of course, PNG didn't bother whether I was certified or not. So I was paying all the expenses, wrote all the exams uh, with a colleague of mine who is in Canada right now. And then he just told me, look, uh, you know, Timmy Topi, I'm I'm going to be speaking at CEPICS. And I'm like, okay, how did you become a speaker at CEPICS? And I'm not aware. And he said, look, I'm just going to be presenting this paper. You can do the same. So I checked and I saw, okay, there is an opportunity to speak. Why not? Right? I have always enjoyed speaking. I love impacting knowledge. Again, Scott, one other thing we have in common, I think I'm going to end up as a lecturer someday. I hope they will allow me to teach. Um, But I think I'm going to end up someday as a lecturer. So I said, okay, let's give it a shot. And to be honest, it started as a joke. I'm like, okay, let's put something together. I don't even know if you will be shortlisted especially because I wasn't presenting something really technical. It wasn't something that has anything to do with supply chain, right? I was t- teaching, I was going to be talking about work-life balance. I thought I've seen enough supply chain professionals who were running out of steam, okay, who were collapsing under the weight of work. And I wanted to bring that perspective to a professional body. So, you know, for some reason, I was picked. And for some reason, it was on the first day after the, a main event, I was like, are you guys kidding me? No one knows me here. You put me on the third day when everyone is tired and maybe a few people will just attend and I'll practice and all of that. It was immediately after the main event. But guess what, Scott and, and, and Jenny, I, I, I gave it my best as usual. And, you know, I did my thing. It was well received. You know, I, I, I was going out and people started, you know, stopping me. Wow, that was fantastic. And then, you know, there is this after meeting we do after your session. The whole place was filled. People started asking questions. And I'm like, wow, this is working. This is interesting. Yeah, but even after that, I never imagined for once that that would be voted the best session in the, in the meeting because I really attended some wonderful session. I mean, Professor Lumumba was there that year. He was speaking. There were a couple of great speakers. So I was like, wow, this is good. So I came both as a speaker and as an attendee. You need to have that perspective. So I attended almost all the other sessions. And to be honest, I had some wonderful stuff, wonderful delivery. And I've always told Jenny, I feel that, you know, SAPIX conference is one of the best organized conferences that I've ever been in my entire life. And I've been to several. I, I attend conferences three, four every year. Right. So for me to keep saying after 10 years is still one of the best organized conference. I mean it. So uh, fast forward to the 
to the evening before the end. I, I, I don't, I cannot remember what you call that evening. And you know, there was this guy, wonderful guy who was sharing jokes and we were all laughing. Fun evening. I mean, I was lost in laughter until Clive, I think, Clive or someone else came and said, hey, Toppy, you're, you're neck to neck with Prof as the best speaker. It, it will be either of you. And I'm like, what's this guy saying? Uh, can he really be serious? And, you know, before we could say Jack, then the announcement was made and then I got best speaker. Not only that, so I got the best speaker and I was about to leave the stage. And then the guy said, no, don't leave. There is another award. You also got the award as the most innovative uh, presentation of the year. So I got two awards in one. And here is the transformation that it cost. So as I was walking down that stage, right, to go to the back and take photographs, I must have met at least not less than 10 people who then wanted me to speak in different conferences. Wow. And for wow. me, that opened a lot of doors. I mean, even Apex wanted me to speak. I'm like, Apex, okay, you know, let's, let's do something. And then I got introduced to the Bill and uh, Melinda Gates Foundation. I did a lot of work with them in Nigeria for a while, actually. I, I see that you brought one of the people I work with on one of, as one of your guests. I cannot remember her name. Um, Deborah the, Doll, I bet. Deborah, Deborah Doll? Doll? Yeah. yeah, Deborah Doll. She's and there brilliant. was a Nigerian uh, as well, Rukayat, I think, who, who was heading a ministry in Nigeria. I worked with them as well. So for me, that just opened up a lot of stuff, opened up lots of opportunities. And the rest is history. I've leveraged those op opportunities from then till now. Jenny. Wow. But you know, you know what's so special is that never once has has he ever forgotten. You know, it's so easy for people to find success and then just close the door on where where the growth started. And the special, lots of special things, but the special thing with Temi Topi is that it's always, there's always room to give back. There's always room to say thank you. And it really is just, it's such an amazing privilege to be able to have watched this incredible person's career um, and, and, and still be a part of it. So thank you for that. Mm. Um, Thank you so much, Jenny. And, and I, I cannot forget, and this is why I say, you know, when CEPIX comes calling, every other thing becomes secondary. You know, wherever mm -hmm. I am, even the last conference, I was in the US, I was joining at 2 a.m. or so, 3 a.m. by time. And I, I feel great doing that because, you know, you never forget your source, mm -hmm. right? That experience, 10 years back, almost exactly 10 years back, opened doors for me that I've never forgotten till now. I was just one of the supply chain guys in Lagos at that time. Now I'm leading uh, a, a regional supply chain, right? I'm leading a regional supply chain for India, Middle East, and Africa. Who would have thought? Wow. So, wow. So. I would have done. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to talk more about what you're doing now professionally and, 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 and especially some of the challenges that, that uh, you're working through day in, day out, which is going to be fascinating. But Jenny, before we go there, personal brand, which holy cow, if you, if you hadn't gotten a sense of Timotope's personal brand already and how cool it is and how invigorating it is, but Jenny, we're going to ask him about that, that a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. He's just one of the first people that actually ever made me realize it was a thing. Um, and, and, and all the little intricacies that go into your own personal brand. And I think, yeah, you're quite right. He lives, breathes. He's, a, he's an absolute example of it. But Timmy Topi, you know, there are, there are a couple of things that I do remember, one of which is that you have to concentrate. It's always important on how you smell. You mustn't ever take that for granted. And, and I just, that's never left me. So that's 10 years old, that memory, I think. But for, for you, just quickly, what, what would be, and I know one, but what would be one really important piece of advice that you would give to someone who maybe is struggling with their personal brand or doesn't realize it's a thing? Why is it so important? I, it, it's so important because, you know, uh, what drove me to that first, and then I'll give the piece of advice. I, I started studying in my company who were those moving and moving so fast. And they were not the supply chain guys, neither were they the manufacturing guys. That's part the fact that we pride ourselves in doing a lot. They were the commercial folks. 
that we detest, we speak against, we're like, why are they moving? What is it doing? The sales guy, what is it doing? This guy is not even that smart. But guess what? Hey, they're already VPs uh, before you are even a regional head. So I started studying what they were doing. And then I stumbled upon this secret that I've taught. And you know, I, I also teach this uh, globally in PNG, the pie principle. So I call it how to bake a pie. Uh, and that talks about your personal brand. How, how do you bake your pie? And pie is, stands for three things. So performance, image, and exposure. Mm. That you are a sum total of these three. Your performance is crucial, it's important. But can I, can I say this? It's not as important as sometimes we think. Mm. It's not the most important. It just gives you a foot at the door. So it, it's important because it gives you a foot at the door. But you know, I, I have supply chain folks who brand their scorecard and say everything is green, I need to be promoted. Yeah, everything can be green and no one is still thinking about you. So performance is one thing and it's important. And I discovered strangely that in the pie, it takes only 20%. I was shocked. I'm like, performance should be like 95 and then other things. No, performance is only around 20%. Your image and exposure is more important. And what's your image? That's, your, that's the personal brand. That's your equity. When your name comes up, what is the one word that sums you up? Lousy? You know, some, some people, want, once, once you mention their name is lousy, then want, some people, when you mention their name is reliable. Mm. You know, that's your image. It's not what you want people to think. It's what people know about you. So when your name comes up, what is the image that, and that's the one that you need to pay attention to. So the advice is you need to project. What do you want people to see? That's the first one then you need to ask what are they seeing and then have a plan to bridge the gap, right? Because a lot of times we see ourselves in one way, your customers are seeing you another way. So you need to ask. I have this conversation with my boss on a regular basis because I don't want to deceive myself. So I ask him, if you're going to describe me in one word, what is it? And I, I see, is this what I want to be noticed as, known as? If not, I need to make adjustments. And then the final one is exposure. Who knows you? Who knows your work? Sometimes, you know, you're in one cocoon doing wonderful stuff, but only your manager knows about your work. That's not going to get you far. Does his manager know? Does the VP know? Does the president know? How do you make sure that what you're doing, the great work that you're doing, mm. does not stop at the desk of your boss? It goes up to leadership. That's exposure. Mm. Once, once upon a time, I, I met, you know, a colleague 10 years old in the company, was already a senior director. And I'm like, of course, other people will be beefing her and wondering, wow, who does she know? I was, I was surprised. And, you know, being the kind of student I am, I was asking, what's this? And she told me of my experience in a year one, when a vice president visited the plant, she presented and the vice president said, hey, listen, I'm going to be responsible for you. I'm going to expose your work. Okay. And everything she does goes to this vice president. Everyone sees it. Whenever there is a problem, the vice president picks a call. Are you willing to solve this problem? And she goes. So she goes, she goes. In 10 years, she's already living a dream, right? Why? Because of exposure. So it's performance, it's image, and it's exposure. So my question always is, how do you bake your pie? Is your pie really smelling nice or is it smelling really bad and people are running away? So much there, Jenny. Uh, I love that. You know, we're in supply chain. We love acronyms, right? Performance, yeah. image exposure. And one of the things that, that I love there, uh, you, you shared so much goodness, uh, Jenny, that I love is you got to make sure your performance does not stop at the desk of your boss or your superior, or your manager. That is so, you know, sometimes some folks, um, I know I was maybe early in my career, you know, you kind of, you kind of get, um, that command structure, right? Wanting to stay kind of uh, within the boundaries and and you know making sure you're going up through the, the the chain of command, so to speak. You know, not and, and it's lost on you that other folks need to be familiar with to your point you're making, Timotope, of what you're doing and who you are and that personal brand and what you can do, uh, because otherwise your opportunities can certainly be uh, stunted and and politically um, limited. 
Uh, but Jenny, that's one of the things I loved that Tim and Topia shared there. What else did you hear that you really enjoyed? Well, it's probably sweet apple pie, probably. <laughs> but just, and it is that. It, it goes back to that. I love that idea of one word. And, and obviously, it's going to change on a daily basis. Sometimes, I would think, you know, you ask someone and you've been horrible to them, which, of course, I never am. Um, and, they, and, and they'll say, you know, moody or something like that. But then in a week's time, if you've done something brilliant, it could change. So it's trying to find that consistency, I think, that reliability, perhaps. So there's lots of, there's, it, it never gets old. Let's just never say this old. pie, this pie and listening to Temi Topi never gets old. There's always something to learn. Uh, and uh, a la mode. We need some ice cream mm -hmm. on that pie, which I'm mm, sure there's definitely. an acronym there. Tim and Tope will cover that maybe in the next <laughs> appearance. But um, I want to shift gears a bit. Uh, you alluded earlier in our chat here about how your your role uh, there at P&G has grown dramatically. It's more regional. And, and I think you mentioned India, uh, the Middle East, uh, Africa. I mean, goodness gracious. I hope you get sleep at night. But um, And we also alluded to, you know, everyone – and their brother and sister know just how challenging uh, global su supply chain has always been. But but really, some of the, I don't want to use the word nuances because they're much more significant than that. But these are new challenges, right? New challenges that we're, we're being pressed to solve. Um, so speak to that a little bit. You know, from your day to day, uh, what are some of the challenges that, that uh, you and your teams are, are faced with? Thank you, Scott, for that question. Um, as you rightly said, I think supply chain itself has been challenging over the years. But, you know, with COVID, it has even become more challenging, right? I was telling, you know, folks the other day that I used to think that my work was more strategic, right? You know, think long term. But I must confess that in the last couple of months, it's been more operational because you need to survive. First and foremost, are you on the shelf? Yeah. So that's that's the first thing. And we've faced multiple challenges. Let, mm. let me talk about some of them. Logistic disruptions. Mm. I don't know if you've seen, uh, th there, is, there is a video now that is making the rounds on how congested some ports in the US are. You, you'll probably not be able to recognize this is a port, right? But there is disruption everywhere. People are missing schedules, right? Um, China, right? Most of a lot of raw materials come out of China. With the instability in China today, you are not even sure of your deliveries. So there's a lot of logistic disruptions. Um, I have worked with, uh, with agents who would even you know, delay your consignment without even updating their website because they are, themselves are not aware that the consignment got delayed. <laughs> so it, it, it's amazing the, the kind of challenges we're facing with logistic disruptions. What about production delays? So this is an outcome of logistic disruptions, right? So the raw materials are not getting to where they're going. So production is not happening, right? That's a lot to deal with. What about commodity pricing? That's a major one today. I, I don't know if you're aware, I'm, I'm just renewing some contracts today. And just because the contract expired and a new one will start, sometimes I'm getting 300% of the old price. No negotiations, nothing asked. I mean, you're just moving from March to June and there is 300% upcharge. Wow. And the guy explains to you that you were lucky in the last one year because it couldn't increase price. It was under contract. So he was already playing at a loss. Now is his opportunity to, to get back on winning ways. So it's giving you 300%, right? Material, you know, electricity, and the guys are passing down the cost actually. So we go into meetings with, 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 with suppliers and they tell you, hey guys, what do you want us to do? Energy price is increasing, the fuel price is increasing, what do you want us to do? Okay. Another challenge we have seen is workforce and labor, especially in places like the US, where you know, with COVID, people are now satisfied being at home, right? right? So even to go back to work, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. So that, that's already a challenge. In my view, one of the biggest challenge that we have, as, uh, we have actually seen and we need to work on is end-to-end -end visibility. Because when all this is happening and you are not even aware of them, it becomes a bigger problem. 
If you are aware, you can plan, right? Maybe trigger some BCP, business continuity plan and all of that. But the point is sometimes you're not even aware. You don't know what's happening. Uh, these things are not updated or they are updated in, in, in silos. So you don't have an end-to-end -end visibility of your supply chain. And this, I would say, has been the biggest challenge that I have seen with my team in the last couple of months. Yeah. Cool. Not just where's my stuff, you know, uh, and, and as, as people have told me throughout my career, hey, bring me your good news, but bring me your bad news too so we can sit down and figure out a plan. If it's in our blind spot, nothing happens. Exactly. And that's the worst case scenario. Um, yeah. So there, there's been some really cool uh, developments, uh, even uh, through the pandemic. Uh, from a technology standpoint that I'm, I'm uh, well, I think we're all hoping uh, has some more breakthrough uh, visibility uh, uh, moments uh, to come. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. And, and I'm glad you mentioned that, Scott, because that's right. Right. Maybe because of that, we've been forced to rethink end to end visibility. I'm also seeing some tools. There, there is an idea called the digital twin. I don't know if you've heard about it. That's really a brilliant idea that is coming where you can simulate what happens in the supply chain on a computer. Yep. Right. And then whatever happens, you change certain parameters and that's what's going to happen in real life. So yep. lots of stuff happening. The other good thing I've seen happen is that supply chain discussions are suddenly taking the center stage. So in most of the board meetings that I attend before, we discuss all the sales and commercial plans. And in the last five minutes, they give you an opportunity to air your views. OK, so tell it up here. What do you think? And then you are rushing to share your views. Today, supply chain is the first on the agenda. Are we even going to be able to supply? Before we, we, we spend money on this, uh, on this commercials, before we spend money on this trade plan, are you even able to supply us? So that, that's also a positive that has come out, right? I am more recognized, I am more known now. Everyone knows my name because in the meeting, I'm the first to say, can you even achieve your plans or should you keep quiet and go home? <laughs> I love, I love the question you used earlier. Are you on the shelf? Are you on the shelf? You know, so that is so, uh, that's such a great way to put, um, especially these, these last couple of years that we've all experienced together and, and the pressure is put on supply chain organizations. Okay. So Jenny, I'm going to switch gears with Timotope in a second, but I want to give you a chance to weigh in. I mean, man, he painted quite a picture of the, the challenges that uh, not just supply chain, they, they take the brunt of it perhaps, but global business is facing. What, what's some of your takes there? Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's really interesting because one of the one of there are two main themes circulating through just to go back to the conference that, that people have proposed topics on. One is sustainability, supply chain sustainability, the other is vis visibility. So you know it's clearly critical. That, that we have this. The other thing that I think was so relevant to what you were saying about how we learn from our mistakes, we learn from things going wrong. And I know people don't want to talk about what went wrong, but isn't it wonderful to be able to talk about how you put it right as well? And you know that's, that's where we need to have those discussions because why make the same mistakes other people have? Why not learn from people's mistakes? Right. But it's brave. It's brave people who share them. Excellent. Yeah. Absolutely. And and uh, you know while I love to see you know I was just I was just writing about about, about this the other day. I love to see the immense contributions and impact that uh, some of the newest members of industry you know that 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 don't have the blinders on of of you know years past they're making. I love it. I mean it's so important. For global supply chain, global business, but uh, at the same time, as 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 much as I value that, I value the power experience because of mistakes that we make as experienced uh, business professionals. Not only can we help our teams and organizations avoid them, but we can help industry from from making the, some of the same mistakes again too. So really, we we value from from all levels of experience. That's a really yeah. powerful uh, thought. Um, Really quick, before we, we go back to Timotope on uh, kind of more of an Africa-focused question, SAPIX 2022, the, the conference that, that um, uh, Timotope was, was uh, sharing about and the one you've touched on a couple of times here, Jenny, that's coming up June 12th through the 15th, right? Uh, how can folks learn more and what's one thing you're looking forward to, Jenny? 
well, I would like a little bit more time. Five weeks <laughs> seems a bit scary. Um, first and foremost, the thing we're looking forward to the most is being back in person. Um, it's, you know, the being able to do it online has been great. And we've been able to engage with you and with Temi Topi. And thank you again for all your support. Um, but, but being back in person, being able to have that face-to-face -face conversation is, I think, what everybody's looking forward to. And, and there are just some outstanding outstanding speakers and and always I'm always just overwhelmed by the support that's given people are prepared to travel um, and it's just really going to be great to get the community back together again agreed agree we're gonna have a link to that in the show notes of today's episode uh, and thanks for all that you and your your SAPIX team does uh, hey if you can sign up to hear people like Tim and Tope it is worth the price of mission and then some so y'all check that out um, mm -hmm. okay so back to uh, my cousin Timotope here, uh, honing in. <laughs> so let's let's talk. You know, you know we, we've kind of gone local and then gone broad, broad, broadly broader, whatever the word is. And now I want to take it back local to the continent of Africa, right? So, what are some of the opportunities you see facing supply chain professionals here today across the continent, Timotope? Well, thanks, Scott, for asking that question. I believe, for me, if I look at the continent of Africa. You know, we're, we're still a lot behind, right? If you take away South Africa, especially, we're even much more behind. I think most of the advancement that we have even seen in supply chain would be, you know, in Southern Africa, thereabouts. In the other parts of Africa, we're still a lot behind. And uh, today, I, I will just look at two things. Uh, number one is infrastructure. Uh, one of the biggest challenge that I've seen is infrastructure. Whether it is physical infrastructure, you know, uh, electronic infrastructure, whatever it is, it's just not available in the continent, right? And I know that in the last couple of years, there has been a lot of investment, but the output has not been commensurate with the investment. I mean, I was head of supply chain for Procter & Gamble in Nigeria, and I can tell you, a couple of times I visited the seaports. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. I mean, from the seaport to anywhere in Nigeria, there is no even rail system. Mm. There's no rail transportation. You're coming to the port with trailers and trucks. No wonder all the roads leading to the port are in a state, mm. the complete state. I mean, you've, you have goods there for two weeks, three weeks sitting. Who does that? Okay. And that's a microsome of what happens elsewhere. Maybe I will take South Africa a bit out. The infrastructures are not just there. Electricity is not there. Rail system is not working. Water transportation is almost missing. Everyone is using the road, right? So that's a big challenge. However, I see a bigger challenge in skill and capabilities. Skill and capabilities. Um, Scott, it will interest you to know you speak to loads of people who say they are doing supply chain and they don't even know the basics. Mm. They don't know what a 13-week plan is. The supply chain for them is purchasing, you know, just buying and selling. That's purchasing, negotiating contracts. That's what purchasing, that's what the supply chain is. But it's bigger than that, right? You, you ask people about demand-driven supply chain, they don't have an idea. And the reasons are not far-fetched. I just told you now, I, I finished as a mechanical engineering graduate. So I, I started working with P&G as an engineer, right? After four or five years of doing engineering, I thought, look, there should be something smarter to do. So I had something called supply chain. Let's go and try it. And then I said, okay, let's see who offers these capabilities. Non-existent. There was no university at that time that was offering it anywhere. Mm. Not as a first degree, not as a second degree. You can imagine that. I had to go to South Africa to get a certification. I know things are improving now. And, you know, with, with CEPIX Help, Jenny, and all the, all the community that we have, they are bringing loads of stuff into the country. And I thank them for that. But it's not existent. So the skills and then the capabilities are absent. They are not there. And that's why, you know, I, I, I find myself fortunate. Even as, as the head of supply chain in Nigeria, when I got out of the country, you know, I had to unlearn and relearn, right? I give you an example. In, as head of supply chain, I was dealing with 30 SKUs. That's it, maximum 30 SKUs in the country. Okay, right now, right now in India alone, I have 200 SKUs wow. that I have to think about every day. In India alone, 
but I was dealing with 30. So you can see that, you know, I'm glad that I work for a company like Procter & Gamble that will then invest in my capabilities to be able to undo the new role. But you can imagine in some places in Africa, they just take you and they throw you into the water. You learn, right. sink or swim. And this is the issue. And that's why I want to reiterate your call, Jenny, earlier on. If you're a supply chain professional listening to this, you need to develop capability. One strong way is join this body of knowledge, join CEPIX, join supply chain now. These are things that will expose you and develop your capability and skills. Mm. You cannot just be a local champion, right? Come and listen to what others are doing and you'll be better for it. I love this notion. Uh, and, and, you know, it kind of takes us back to where we started, uh, you know, being, you can't just be a local champion, right? Um, uh, you really stunt your growth going back to the pie, you know, the pie acronym and, and, and your performance, trying to make sure it doesn't stop at the desk of your boss. Um, you know, the good news, the good news, um, you know, in light of all those challenges and opportunities that you shared there, uh, Timotope, you know, Jenny, we've had lots of different conversations with business leaders across Africa. You know, we've got a trade deal involving all the various countries that make up the continent uh, that that uh, has been signed, is making, continue makes a lot of progress. That's composed a ton of opportunities. We've had, we've got movements of onshoring, manufacturing, production onto the continent of Africa which is a great thing. As we all know, manufacturing it are big um, cogs of the economy, uh, economic development, right? And, and the whole globe benefits from that. Uh, but to Timotope's point, for any part of the world to, um, to, to fully leverage those types of, of uh, trends, movements, whatever, we've got to have infrastructure and we've got to have a workforce, right? Uh, and that's, you know, that's been an interesting part of this this world we've been living in uh, the, these workforce dynamics that, that we won't have time to get into here today. But uh, but the good news is lots of opportunity. The challenging news is we got a lot of heavy lifting to make sure we can fully capitalize on it. So, um, but Jenny, uh, what what else from what he shared there that was more Africa centric? What were uh, your thoughts there? Yeah, it goes back to the professionalization. It goes back to that. The COVID silver lining, I guess, that, you know, to Timmy Topi's point, he's now the most popular person or unpopular person in the boardroom. Um, but people know his name and people know or start to understand the importance of what it is he does. And I think we've gone from that whole scenario where people only understand or care about supply chains when they go wrong. Mm. Now we're actually getting to that point where we're starting to be as a as a as a company, perhaps we're starting to be more more proactive to, to try to find ways so that they don't go wrong and to do that collectively. Um, and, and, and it's just that example of that education. And I think that, you know, conversations we've had with people in the public health sector, which is where so many supply chain professionals are having to do things intuitively because they're not in a position to be able to get the supply chain education that they need, we've got to address this and we've got to make sure that supply chain management is recognized as the profession it is and that the education is, is available. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, you know, that's really what, what we do every day is to try to educate that education is so important. I'm with you. And, and, and I would add to that list, uh, the, the networking is available. Uh, the connectors yeah. are there, like you that yeah. we talked about on the front yeah. end is so important. And um, um, but there's a healthy upstream of ideas that, that the yeah. ideas that don't all, you know, for so long, it feels, I mean, I think even prior to the pandemic, uh, global business was, was in, in my opinion, more slow to embrace new ideas, more slow to work with startups, you know, because there, there was, there was, mm -hmm. there's more risk perhaps, but now the industry is to the point where I think more and more we're embracing, we're looking for these new ideas. And, and that takes a deliberate um, uh, leadership presence to make sure that I think that upstream uh, is available and, 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 and action is taken on these ideas. It's not just in that cliche innovation where, well, let's have a great two hour whiteboard session and all the ideas stay on the whiteboard. What does that do? <laughs> um, so anyway, I digress, but um, Tim Atope, you just, you, you just spark so many ideas. Um, and, and, and really uh, it, it's, uh, I love your approach. I love your passion that you, you exude passion 
uh, in your perspective here today. But I think we got one more question before we make sure folks know how to connect with Tim and Tope. Um, so Jenny, what, uh, what what's, I think you've got the honor of our final question, right? I think I do, but I think there's so many things that you've sort of addressed to answer this anyway, mm. but I'm going to put, put you on the spot and ask you for one thing, one thing that you have seen that has really changed since you first started out in your supply chain career. What's one thing on the continent that you know and you have seen that has changed beyond your wildest dreams? Thank you, Jenny. I think I answered it in my last response, but let me let me underline. One thing is awareness, right? So mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> versus, you know, 12, 13 years ago when I ventured into supply chain, when if you, if you tell anybody in Africa you are in supply chain, they, what, what is that? You are not a doctor, mm -hmm. you are not a, an engineer, what supply what? Right now, you know, people are starting to understand, though I still feel the, the definition is very narrow, but people are starting to understand what supply chain is. Two is um, the education is also, you know, improving. It's not where it should be, but with, with help from people like you, I know the work you're doing in the country, uh, and I know you visited a few times, you know, things are starting to improve. Mm. Uh, not only with the, with the formal ed education, but also with the, with the connections. So I give you an example of, my, of the connection that I had with uh, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Amazing. I was in Kaduna the other day for a couple of days, you know, training and teaching government workers. Who, who, all the things I was teaching them was like magic. You know, I'm teaching them how to even have a vision, a supply chain vision, and it's like magic, right? But that has also improved. So with, with the collaboration right now, you know, people are seeing a bit more. So education has changed. Awareness has changed. The collaborative environment has changed. But I must confess that we're still way off from where it should be. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact that there has been movement in the right direction, we're still not where we should be completely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's a good thing. You know, that's a good thing. I, I think if we can, uh, if, if we can take that mentality and, and um, get our industry, the supply chain industry to really embrace it, that there is no finish line, right? Even mm -hmm. after the biggest accomplishments, there is no finish line because there's always more to, more to improve, more to, more to do, uh, more new developments to, to chase after and pursue. But Jenny, you were about to say something. Sorry. Yeah, I was. I was just going to say quickly because, you know, you've alluded to it and I think that it, it, it needs to be said over and over and over again, is that education is not just all about textbooks. You know, it's not it's not about who knows the best fact or that it's down to experience. It, you learn from other people. It's about yep. networking. It's about it's about the, all of it. Yep. And, and we need to get away. We need to teach our kids that life is not just all about what qualification you have or what piece of paper you have um it's it's about so much more than that amen completely agree <laughs> I completely agree hey um by the way one of the things that i really enjoyed the last episode we had with our friends from village reach we're doing some really cool mm -hmm. things especially in healthcare a big shout out to them and our dear friend uh at a bio adila k the one and only um so timotope Let's make sure folks know how to connect. And we're just scratching the surface with what you could share here today. Uh, I, I love a good hour, but man, we need a couple more here uh, as we sit down with you. But how can folks connect with you and learn more? The best way to connect with me is on LinkedIn. So just look for me on LinkedIn, send an invite. I would, I would accept and we can get connected and learn from each other. I love it. Um, I love it. I tell you, LinkedIn has come a long way, hasn't it? Uh, I, I, we got in the wrong business, Jenny. We should have, we should have invented a social media platform, huh? but it is powerful. Uh, I love uh, the connections we've made here. I really love this conversation we've had. Uh, you, you share so much um, passion, but also really practical uh, perspective that, are, that that's actionable. So big thanks uh, to you, uh, Tim Atope, Agun Fayo, Senior Director, Supply Network Operations at P&G. We hope to have you back again very soon. It would be my pleasure, Scott, and thank you. Thanks to Jenny for inviting me. I couldn't think of a better way to spend my afternoon. Outstanding. <laughs> well, we're going to have you back. Uh, I'm, you're going to be back uh, by popular demand. By that time, Jenny, we might have to go through his agent uh, because he, he's... Uh, <laughs> That's you know, he's me. Be, 
He's okay. <laughs> He's going to be in Hollywood soon. But uh, nevertheless, uh, Jenny, as we wrap here, what's one of your favorite things that Timotope shared here today? Well, first of all, I'm just staking my claim. I am the agent, right? <laughs> no negotiations. Um, I, 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 for me, one of the things that sort of has hit home the most is is that 300% increase. It's that it's that gap between um, when what when the first com- contract was to what the contract's going to be now, and the reality that this is all going to come downstream. It's all going to come down to us, the consumer, and uh, and you know. Fortunately, we're lucky with people like Timmy Topi who are there at the at the sharp end, but not not every organization has got that. And and so I think, yeah, it's going to be interesting times ahead. Uh, completely agree. Completely agree. And it, it's a, such a wonderful time. Challenging. Sure. Um, gives the headaches. Sure. But it's such a wonderful mm-hmm. time to be in global supply chain and to rub elbows oh, sure. with folks like both of y'all. So, um, hey, listeners, hopefully you enjoyed this conversation as much as Jenny and I have. Tim and Tope is a special individual. Um, be sure to check out SAPIX 2022. It's coming up. Uh, by the time we publish this, it'll be probably, sorry, Jenny, about four weeks away. Uh, so it's <laughs> the 12th to the 15th of June, SAPIX.org. You'll find a link also in the uh, show notes. Be sure to connect with Tim and Tope. Uh, Gunfayo on LinkedIn. You won't regret it. Uh, it's like it's a must see, uh, must see connection. But whatever you do, hey, be like Tim and Tope, be like Jenny Froome, do good, give forward, be the change that's needed. And on that note, we'll see you next time right back here at Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for being a part of our Supply Chain Now community. Check out all of our programming at SupplyChainNow.com and make sure you subscribe to Supply Chain Now anywhere you listen to podcasts and follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. See you next time on Supply Chain Now.